Hey everybody, welcome back to All Fiction is Fantasy. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, this episode is going to be uh, the first episode in a new series, and this series is a companion piece to a series that I will be starting on my board game channel, The Dungeon Dive. That series is going to be a deep dive look at Arkham Horror 2nd Edition, the board game from Fantasy Flight Games. And as part of that series, I will be reading, reviewing, and recommending a story focusing on uh, the great old ones, the outer gods, the ancient ones featured in the game. Because I think those games actually, while I love them, I think the Arkham File games do a really bad job of suggesting stories for people to read who want to learn more about the lore and the Cthulhu mythos. In this first episode, we are taking a look at Azathoth, the blind idiot god, and the featured story will be the sect of the idiot from Thomas Ligotti. So Azathoth is an outer god, a cosmic entity of great significance. Uh, the great old ones are their offspring. Azathoth is perhaps the most powerful being in the entire Cthulhu mythos. Azathoth slumbers in the heart of chaos. Some say that all of reality is nothing but Azathoth's dream. And should he ever wake, everything would cease to exist except for Azathoth, who would then be alone again to fall back to sleep to dream a new reality. Azathoth is kept in his supernatural slumber by cosmic flute music, which is totally prog rock, and I love that. H.P. Lovecraft himself didn't actually write a lot about Azathoth. He mentions him a few times, or it a few times. Uh, the main prose consists of a few paragraphs from an incomplete uh, novel or novella, as well as this from an epic poem that H.P. Uh, Lovecraft wrote called Fungi from Yugoth. And this is part 22, and this part is called Azathoth, and I'm going to read that here. Out in the mindless void the demon bore me, past bright clusters of dimensioned space, till neither time nor matter stretched before me, but only chaos without form or place. Here the vast lord of all in darkness muttered, things he had dreamed but could not understand, while near him shapeless bat things flopped and fluttered in idiot vortices that ray streams fanned. They danced insanely to the high, thin whining of a cracked flute crutched in a monstrous paw, whence flaw the aimless waves whose chance combining gives each frail cosmos its eternal law. I am his messenger, the demon said, as in contempt he struck his master's head. So Azathoth seems to be highly influenced by Lord Denzani's Mana Yud Sushai from his seminal work The Gods of Pagana, which was a huge influence on Lovecraft and the entire Cthulhu mythos. Denzani's work really is where the foundations of the mythos comes from, and in Denzani's Lords of Pagana, he writes, uh, Before there stood gods upon Olympus, wherever was Allah, had wrought and rested Mana Yud Sushai. There are in Pagana, Mung and Sish and Kib, and the maker of all small gods, who is Mana Yud Sushai. Moreover, we have faith in Rune and Slid. And it has been said of old that all things that have been were wrought by the small gods, excepting only Mana Yud Sushai, who made the gods and hath thereafter rested. And none may pray to Mana Yud Sushai, but only the gods whom he hath made. But at the last will Mana Yud Sushai forget to rest, and will make again new gods and other worlds, and will destroy the gods whom he hath made. And the gods and the worlds shall depart, and there shall be only Mana Yud Sushai. So now let's move on to the uh, the Sect of the Idiot by Thomas Ligotti, which is the uh, story featuring Azathoth that we are reviewing today. This was originally published or orig originally uh, compiled in the Songs of a Dead Dreamer, published in 1989, and it has also recently been published in a book called Lovecraft's Monsters, edited by the great Ellen Daltro. So it makes sense that Thomas Ligotti would uh, sometimes draw influence 
from Azathoth in his writing, given Elagadi's own sense of pessimism and existential nihilism. Nothing speaks more fully to the futile and meaningless existence of humanity than the idea of everything merely being the dream of a blind idiot deity. The Sect of the Idiot is the story of an unnamed narrator in an unnamed city who discovers a truth that eventually drives him mad. The city is being controlled by freakish, freakish humanoid cultists who are themselves nothing but idiot servants to a power greater than anything they could imagine. The, narr the narrator seems to be uh, relieved, maybe even pleased of his discovery because it reinforces his feelings of meaningless, that it would actually be better to have never existed. I want to read a passage here where the narrator is describing a dream that he had. At the time, I did not feel myself to be of any consequence in this or any other universe. I was a nothing more than an unseen speck lost in the convolutions of strange schemes. And it was this very remoteness from the designs of my dream universe, this feeling of fantastic homelessness amid an alien order of being that was the source of anxieties I had never before experienced. I was no more than an irrelevant parcel of living tissue caught in a place I could not be, threatened with being snared in some great dredging net of doom, an incidental shred of flesh pulled out of its element of light and into icy blackness. In the dream, nothing supported my existence, which I felt at any moment might be horribly altered or simply ended. In the most far-reaching import of the phrase, my life was of no matter. So Ligotti's stories often feature narrators discovering a terrible truth hidden in the slums of mediocrity, whether that be in the gray, joyless halls of a cubicle-infested office building, or the black and greasy inner workings of a factory, or the concrete, hellish landscapes of modern cities. But his narrators are rarely seekers of truth. The truth imposes itself on their insignificant lives. I love the way that uh, Ligotti describes the cultists and the details of the chairs they sit in. Um, it reminds me a lot of all of the chairs scattered about the video games of Bloodborne and the nightmare landscapes of Bloodborne and throughout Elden Ring. Uh, From Software seems to really be infatuated with chairs as well. I want to read two passages uh, where Ligotti describes the, the cultists and the chairs in which they sit. Though each of them was completely draped in a massive cloak, here he's talking about the cultists, uh, the places in which the material of these garments pushed out and folded inwards as it descended to the floor, along with the unnatural contrivance of the chairs whereupon these creatures were situated, betrayed a peculiarity of a formation that held me in the state of both paralyzed terror and spellbound curiosity. What were these beings that their robes should undumbrate such unaccountable configurations? With their tall, angular chairs arranged in a circle, they appeared to be leaning in every direction like unsettled monoliths. It was as if they were assuming postures that were mysteriously symbolic, locking themselves in patterns hostile to mundane analysis. Above all, it was their heads, or at least their topmost segments, that were skewed most radically as they inclined toward one another, nodding in ways hysterical to terrestrial anatomy. And it was from this part of their structures that there came forth a soft buzzing noise which seemed to serve to them as speech. Oh man, that is, that is so great. That is such fantastic detail. And here we have the final passage here. They were as strange as I had dreamed, more closely resembling devices of torture than any type of practical or decorative object. Their tall backs were slightly bowed and covered with a coarse hide unlike anything I had ever beheld. Their arms were like blades and each had four semicircular grooves cut into them that were spaced evenly across their length. 
and below were six jointed legs jutting forwards, a feature which transformed each piece into some crab-like thing with the apparent ability to scuttle across the floor. If, for a stunned moment, I felt the idiotic desire to install myself in one of these bizarre thrones, this impulse was extinguished upon my observing that the seat of each chair, which at first appeared to be composed of a smooth and solid cube of black glass, was in fact only an open cubicle filled with a murky liquid which quivered strangely when I passed my hand over its surface. So while Azathoth's name is never specifically referenced in the Sect of the Idiot, its cosmic presence is felt throughout. From the use of the word idiot in the title and the few times in the text that it is muttered, it is clear that Lagadi is appealing to the based nature of the outer idiot god. So the Sect of the Idiot is a great story from Thomas Lagadi. I think it exemplifies a lot of his uh, best features, his strong prose, his appeal to this kind of a cosmic meaningless of existence. Very few can write passages like Legati, and he just kind of like taps into this very primal part of my brain, and I think that's why I love his writing so much. So, all right, guys, so I hope you enjoyed this review of The Sect of the Idiot from Thomas Legati, this brief look at Azathoth, and expect more of this kind of thing to come in the future. Have a good one. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.